Yeah, so I know most of you guys in the room, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt. Uh, I started volunteering here about two and a half years ago, but even before then, I was researching the zoo's history. Uh, unfortunately, the zoo's history is not very well documented. Uh, most of it's from the 1990s onward, even as far as the zoo's archives and things like that. So it's been hundreds of hours of going through various uh, news articles and you know documented newspapers to try and build up the history that I have today. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Anyone know who these people are, by the way? Uh, these are the 11 directors of the zoo's history. Put them in there somewhere. Okay, so uh, we started our presentation in the 1920s. Uh, it was boom time for South Florida, also known as the Roaring Twenties for the rest of the country. Uh, South Florida was founded very early on. Uh, West Palm Beach, for example, was founded in 1894. Uh, and by the 1920s, it had been built up into quite a small town. But right in the middle of West Palm Beach, was Lake Clark. Lake Clark was a sizable lake that took up many acres of land, about uh, two to three hundred acres in total. And uh, the land surrounding the lake was not usable for the most part. Lake Clark was a self-contained lake, so every time it would rain, the water would go way up, and every time it didn't rain for quite some time, it would go way down. So it made the land mostly unusable. So starting, by the way, uh, you can see on the map there, Dreyer Park is located right there. Palm Beach Zoo is in the red, and the remainder of Lake Clark today is in the blue. But starting in 1914, uh, the city started to drain the lake. Uh, originally, it was connected to the nearby Palm Beach Canal that's found on the other side of I-95 there. And then in 1919, it was connected to nearby uh, Lake Osborne, which is found to the south of Spillway. And by the time they were done draining it around 1919 or 1920, the water had lowered several feet, and the land around it was usable. Part of the land that was underwater by Lake Clark uh, turned into a small park called Bacon Park. Not much was really in that park in the early days. A uh, small landfill was built in the park, as many of you keepers know from your exhibits. Um, and a small tourist camp, uh, a tent city tourist camp was built in the park. Uh, it was used for automobile tourists. By this time, automobiles were quite common, and the city needed something to accommodate tourism. Um, that was all destroyed in the 1928 hurricane, that tent city, and much of the land in Bacon Park wasn't used for quite some time. That uh, was until 1932, um, when the city hired Paul Dreyer as the very first parks director for the city of West Palm Beach. Paul Dreyer was born on September 20th, uh, 1902 in Wurttemberg, Germany. And from an early age, he had an interest in horticulture. Uh, he went to the University of Hohenheim in Germany to study horticulture. And following World War I, he immigrated over to South Florida using money from his family that was over here. And he got various jobs working in different local nurseries. He got married on April 5th, 1931. Uh, and following that, he got a job in 1932 as the very first parks director. So Paul Dreher worked to continue to try and improve the parks around West Palm Beach. Uh, however, by the 1940s, as I said, um, Bacon Park was languishing. Not much had been done with it. And Paul Dreher wanted to turn that around. So, by 1951, Paul Dreyer convinced the city to buy the 108-acre Bacon Park uh, for $100, and he got to work improving the park. That's a quote right there. It's sarcasm, obviously. He was an 80-year-old man by the time that was uh, said. Um, so, uh, he first of all went to work draining the land. Uh, a lot of it was just swamp land left over from uh, Lake Clark that had never been properly drained. So we started draining that and contained the rest of the water into man-made lakes around uh, Bacon Park. Uh, in addition, he started building amenities for people to visit the park. So baseball fields, uh, model airplane fields, picnic areas, all of that for uh, visitors to Bacon Park to use. And by 1957, he had improved the park so much that the city renamed Bacon Park Rare Park in his honor. Barnyard beginnings. So Paul Dreher, keeping with his mission to try to improve the park with amenities, uh, around 1960 or 1961, he built a red barn. This is actually the only picture still left in existence of that barn. Uh, and using $18 of his own money, Paul Dreher bought for that barn in the park. There we go. One goat, two ducks, one goose, and two chickens. And those six animals became the very first animals of the Dreyer Park Zoo. If I call it Dreyer Park Zoo, in case anyone doesn't know, up until 1997 it was called Dreyer Park Zoo. Uh, so in case anyone's wondering if I ever use that again in the presentation. So, Farm to Family Zoo. 
Paul Dreher retired from his position as Parks Director in August 1962. Uh, he had held the position for over 30 years and today is still the longest uh, serving Parks Director for the City of West Palm Beach. And replacing him is a man named Hugh Austin. Now, Paul Dreher is usually the name that comes up when you're talking about the zoo's history since it's Dreher Park Zoo uh, and Dreher Park in there. But other than building the barn, he didn't really accomplish much in the zoo's history. A lot of the early stuff that came to evolving the zoo came under Hugh Austin. So that evolution started on September 5th, 1963, with the very first exotic animal donated to the zoo. So Hugh Austin could be seen right there on the left-hand side. And in the middle is a 16-year-old named Joanne Pelosi. Uh, on the right side is Joanne Pelosi's brother. Him and his friend visited the Dominican Republic and Joanne asked for them to bring her home a present of some sort, uh, a postcard or you know, snow globe, or something like that. Instead, they brought her home a three and a half foot rhinoceros iguana. Um, so that rhinoceros iguana ran around their house for about a week and ended up ruining up their couches and their walls and their carpets. And that was changed. <laughs> and it didn't work very well. So a week later, uh, it was donated to Hugh Austin to add to the barnyard menagerie that was inside Dreher Park. And this very first donation sparked a bit of a donation craze. Uh, animals from all over the city started coming in the <coughs> zoo and being donated to Hugh Austin. Uh, that included only a week later, the very first primate of the zoo's history was donated. That would be Pudgy, the Capucha monkey. Uh, Pudgy's owner can be seen on the left there. Hugh Austin again is on the right. Uh, Pudgy was used in different films and commercials. Uh, that's what his owner used him for. But after hearing about the drive to bring in donations of exotic animals, uh, he donated Pudgy to the zoo. And that donation continued in, <laughs> in February 1964 with the donation of Joey the Kangaroo. So in 1959, an airline pilot was visiting Australia, and next to the airport, he found a small baby kangaroo for sale. And he ended up purchasing that kangaroo and brought it back to the United States. Uh, because of his job as an airline pilot, he wasn't able to continue to take care of the kangaroo, and he gave it to his friend in West Palm Beach, uh, Walter Brooks III, Walter Brooks III and his family kept Joey the kangaroo, as he was known by this time, in a small pen in his backyard, as well as inside his house. Uh, and in that time, over the next couple of years, Joey would grow from a small little Joey kangaroo uh, into a fully grown kangaroo, and he was eventually able to hop out of his pen. Uh, he would go around the city of West Palm Beach. Uh, he became known for crashing cocktail parties and things like that. <laughs> So he became quite famous uh, because of his little escapades around the city. Uh, for example, he was on the local YMCA logo. Uh, he became an honorary Boy Scout member. Uh, he was featured in two issues of Life magazine, 1961 and 1964. He had a full article in 1964. Uh, and in addition, he was frequently visited at the house by Caroline Kennedy, uh, John Kennedy's daughter, since they had their own down here. Good. So in 19... Uh, 61, December 1961, uh, Walter Brooks III received a letter from an attorney named Ellen Middleton against the possession of Joey, and that led to a West Palm Beach ordinance that banned everything except cats, dogs, uh, canaries, parrots, and parakeets. Anyone have pets that doesn't fall into that list? No, there's a couple in the last one. Anyways, so all other pets were going to be banned, and that obviously was not a very uh, exciting news for many residents of the city. And they campaigned for two years. Uh, petitions were started for people who were keeping pets. Uh, one prominent uh, person was keeping an Aldabra tortoise in their backyard. So, uh, so after two years, uh, the zoo, or rather the city, finally changed their rules and allowed other animals to be kept again. But Joey was not permitted to stay as a house pet. So on February 29th, 1964, uh, he became the newest resident of the zoo. Now, for about one year, Joey was the main attraction since he was so famous for the city. Uh, that would change on April 16, 1965, with the arrival of Toppy the elephant. So, Toppy was a small two and a half year old elephant that was owned by Jet's Petting Zoo. Uh, Jet's Petting Zoo was a traveling menagerie that would go around the country visiting different shopping malls. And in 1963, Jet's Petting Zoo visited uh, the West Coast Shopping Plaza, which is down the street from here. And people in West Palm Beach fell in love with the baby elephant that they saw. And they decided, we need this baby elephant for the zoo. So uh, after an offer from the Top Value Trading Stamp Company, they needed about 1,000 books of Top Value Trading Stamps in order to buy the elephant. Is anyone familiar with what trading stamps are? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Uh, trading stamps at the time were something that if you went to 
a grocery store, for example, you would receive them with your purchases, and then you could redeem them for different prizes that would be in trading stamp catalogs. Let me go ahead and pass around. This is a book from 1965. This is the type of book <coughs> that would be used to buy Top of the Elephant. Uh, it's only 999 more we would need. So, we're getting there. Um, so, the city of West Palm Beach really banded together in buying Top of the Elephant. It became something that every household became a part of trying to collect a book. Uh, in order to buy Toppy. Uh, local hotels even started uh, building and buying, or rather selling, uh, uh, ceramic elephants and wooden animals uh, for one book of trading stamps for about three dollars. And finally, in 1966, the money was fully purchased, uh, the money was fully raised and they were able to buy Toppy, but earlier than that, on April 16th, 1965, before all the money was raised, uh, Toppy arrived at the zoo. In that picture, that's set, uh, Commissioner George S. Williams having a ride on Toppy the Elephant. Uh, so the West Palm Beach Firemen's Benevolent Association, uh, which was an association of firemen at the time, uh, worked hard to raise money and ended up buying the elephant with those trading stamps. Uh, the zoo never owned Toppy. She was donated. So Toppy would be a resident of the zoo for almost 10 years, and in that time she would grow from a small uh, four-year-old, 2,000-pound elephant to a fully grown, mature Asian elephant. So the zoo's first births. There it is. So up until this point, the zoo had existed for about five years, and no births had occurred. Mm -hmm. On May 20, 1965, the very first birth of the zoo occurred. Uh, this was a baby squirrel monkey that was born. The zoo was not expecting the squirrel monkey. They didn't know the female was pregnant. They instead expected a goat named Nanny Bell to give birth to the first animal uh, born at the zoo. But that was surprising for them when the first birth happened. But it was even more surprising that very same day that the second birth at the zoo happened. Uh, this is Jocko and Clarabelle. Uh, they arrived at the zoo four days earlier on May 16th, 1965. Uh, and they knew that Clarabelle was pregnant, they just didn't know she was going to give birth so soon. So later that very same day after the squirrel monkey, she gave birth. So the zoo had existed for about five years, and the very the two births happened on the very same day. So Nanny Bell ended up giving birth about a week later on June 1st, 1965, and that miniature goat became the third animal born at the zoo. So the Zoological Society of the Palm Beaches. So by this time, uh, Hugh Austin had retired after being uh, parks director for quite a few years. Uh, he was able to bring a lot of the donations into the zoo, uh, bring Toppy and Joey and the very first births, and really built it from a barnyard into an actual working facility by this time. And after Hugh Austin came a new parks director named John Van Epp. Uh, John Van Epp would be the parks director while the Zoological Society was forming. So by 1967, uh, a zoo committee had been formed for the city parks department. Uh, there was a larger committee uh, that was handling all the improvement of the parks, and then this subcommittee that was handling the improvement of the growing zoo. So some of the original people that were part of it would include Charles Camus. Uh, he was very big in city politics. Howard Blake, uh, who started as the zoo's veterinarian in 1964 and became uh, part of this. And George Samra, uh, who would who was also very involved in politics, along with Norman Joyce Kilmer, uh, William Beebe, and Shepard Lesser. And then John Van as I said, was the parks director at the time. Uh, so one of the first projects was starting an entrance for the zoo. At this time, there wasn't really a solid entrance. Uh, so finally, in 1968, the plan got approved. Does anyone recognize that structure? Is it the admin building? No, not the admin building. Close. Jan recognized it last time, but uh, this is the zoo's entrance today. Uh, it was originally opened in 1969 as the zoo's entrance. Exit. Exit, I am sorry. Exit. And in 2003, the new entrance was built, and this became the zoo's exit. Um, up until that new entrance, the entry and exit of the zoo were the same building. They would both be exited over there. The gift shop would later be added on in 1987, uh, but the rest of the structure was built at this time by the Zoo Improvement Committee. So that Zoo Improvement Committee, uh, on March 27, 1969, ended up founding the Zoological Society of the Palm Beaches. Uh, this would be the seven founding members uh, that you saw on the last slide would all sign as the original seven members of the Zoological Society. I'm going to ask you guys to be very careful with this because it's my property. But this, is <laughs> but this is the original certificate of incorporation for the Zoological Society. 
So well, keep in mind, room. the zoo doesn't even have a copy of. I was gonna say, where did, How you, did you get it? I will talk about that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I did not <laughs> steal it. Pawn shop? No. Um, those are probably only about seven or eight ever made for each of the copy members in the zoo. So that's one of them. Um, so with that zoological society, uh, that's Howard Wade, by the way, right there. The first society president would be Charles Camus. Uh, the very first zoo director would be Howard Waite, who, as I said, was a veterinarian up until that point and continued to be the veterinarian while he was zoo director. And the first curator under the Zoological Society would be Donald Anderson. Uh, there had been curators before, uh, such as Ed Carrison in 1965, but they functioned more as a keeper would function today as opposed to a curator. Donald Anderson under the Zoological Society took more of a curatorial role. So on October 1st, 1969, the zoo the Zoological Society officially took over the operation of the zoo. And October 5th, 1969, there was a, a ceremony held where the society handed the mayor a $1, 1886 silver dollar. Uh, they wanted to hold it off till the weekend. That's why it didn't happen on October 1st, because they were hoping to attract more people to the ceremony. And then October 5th rolls around and it rains the entire day. So, uh, not too many people actually attended, but for example, FPNL had a uh, man in a gorilla suit come to it. Uh, so a couple kids came, especially later when the rain died down. So under the Zoological Society, there were major improvements made. Uh, for the first time, the paths were paved by 1972, uh, and a lot of the old caging that was falling apart from the early days of the 1960s uh, had been replaced. This is also the time where Paul Dreyer's barn uh, got torn down. Uh, as you guys know, being in the zoo, if you have something made of wood and it's in there for more than a decade or so, it doesn't last too well. And by 1972, that barn was in bad shape. Uh, so it was torn down by a handyman named George Tears, uh, who worked at the zoo for 18 years. You guys are out in the butterfly garden, there's a stepping stone for him. So 1969, that same year that the Zoological Society was founded, brought Hammer the Black Bear. So has anyone ever heard of Gentle Ben? Yes. Yeah. There you go. Gentle Ben was originally a TV show that ran from 1967 to 1969. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's basically about a game warden and his son who have a pet bear and live in South Florida. Um, so the original bear that was mainly used for it was a bear named Bruno, but one of the four bears that were used in total was named Hammer. Uh, he was mainly used for the water scenes since he was most controllable when he was in the water, uh, as opposed to the other black bears. In 1969, the show ended, and Hammer found a new home here at the zoo. Uh, he would be at the zoo until 1988. And then soon after, in 1973, brought the very first tiger of the zoo. Uh, this is Princess the Bengal Tiger. Uh, Princess was originally living at the Knoxville Zoo. She had been moved from zoo to zoo. Nobody really wanted her. She was a surplus animal. And she was living at the Knoxville Zoo in a basement of one of their buildings. Uh, she was about 100 pounds underweight. So she came in 1973. Unfortunately, the Zoological Society was still relatively new at the time, um, and they didn't really have the money to afford building a brand new big enclosure. As you guys know, you know that's a $1 billion enclosure there. They simply didn't have that money. Uh, so in October 1974, uh, Princess the Tiger moved to Lion Creek Safari, who at that time had seven other tigers. So a decade has passed since we last talked about Tavi. And on March 12, 1975, Tommy ended up leaving the zoo. So Tommy left for a variety of reasons. One was a financial problem that the zoo was having. It was slowly building up debt, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but on top of that, Tommy became kind of a danger. Uh, as I said before, she would grow from this small baby elephant into a fully grown adult elephant. One day, she ended up leaning on the bars of her enclosure and ended up breaking them in half. Uh, steel bar she was able to bend. On top of that, Howard Waite, as I said, he was, in addition to the zoo's first director, also uh, the zoo's first veterinarian, he was in her enclosure one day in 1972, and something spooked Toppy on I-95, and she went ramming into Howard Waite. Uh, he ended up getting five broken ribs and a collapsed lung. Uh, he was in the hospital for a week. So in addition to the financial problems, she was becoming quite a danger. So, Tommy was sold to Lionheart Safari uh, in California, but originally moved to Lionheart Safari down here in Loxahatchee. Uh, she did not want to leave. On March 12th, it took a three hour struggle to get her onto her enclosure, and the entire time she was kicking and dragging and leaning 
uh, the trunk. That's not a tilted picture, picture right there. It's <laughs> leaning that far. Uh, but finally, after uh, she arrived in Lancaster Safari, she was able to see other elephants for the first time in almost 15 years. So, so in 1981, brought Spanky the weather predicting sun bear. <laughs> So Spanky was in a roadside zoo uh, up in northern Florida and was purchased for the zoo uh, in 1981. And by 1983, a bit of an event had come out of Spanky's arrival at the zoo, where each Groundhog Day, Spanky would come out from his little side yard into the enclosure. And if, West, if Spanky saw his shadow, West Palm Beach would have six more weeks of winter. So. Yeah, that was the zoo's fun time film. Uh, Spanky and Moki would be here until 1991 and 1992. Moki is the other subject that lived with Spanky. And not really relevant to the zoo's history, but I wanted to throw it in. Can we get those photos? <laughs> yeah. um, but in 1981, brought Top of the Reach to Amazon. Top today is the longest resident of the zoo at 33 years. Uh, so, continue. Uh, 1983, that same year that the weather predicting sun bear trend came, uh, brought the Goldie's Monkey exhibit. Now, Goldie's Monkeys originally arrived at the zoo in 1981. Uh, the curator at the time, Sally Lieb, had gone up uh, on a conference to Louisville Zoo and had talked to the key, primate keeper uh, for the Brookfield Zoo. Brookfield at the time was the only zoo in America to be keeping Goldie's Monkeys, and they had so many they were looking for about nine or ten other zoos to distribute them to. And in that meeting with Sally Lee, she was able to uh, make sure that Dray Park Zoo would become one of nine zoos to receive all these monkeys. So they arrived in 1981, and 1983 brought uh, the construction and completion of the Goldie's Monkey exhibit. Uh, the Dray Park Zoo would be the first zoo in America to house Goldie's Monkeys outdoors. So a zoo in trouble. So like I said when we were talking about uh, Toppy's departure, the zoo had been slowly building up debt over the years. Uh, it became quite a problem, and the zoo was not able to function properly. So, by 1984, over $90,000 in debt had been uh, accumulated for the zoo. If that was to be equivalent to the zoo being in debt today, it would be uh, about a five and a half million dollar uh, debt for the zoo on its operating budget. Um, so it became quite a problem right there. Uh, you can see Dave Ellis with this quote right there. Dave Ellis was the director, the third director of the zoo. Uh, who ended up selling copy. However, in 1984, Michael July became the zoo's new director, and in about one year's time, he was able to turn the zoo from $90,000 in debt to $26,000 in profit, uh, like with business practices. And in 1985, with the excess money, uh, the zoo was able to open up a new otter exhibit. Uh, this otter exhibit, by the way, was roughly where the fountain is today. Uh, it would function as the zoo's otter exhibit until the current exhibit opened in 2001. So, in July 12, 1986, brought Takey, uh, the hybrid panther. Takey was at a zoo up in northern Florida, the Tallahassee Junior Museum. They were keeping, yep, they were keeping a group of Florida panthers, and in their past, they had a Central American cougar that bred with their Florida panthers. And eventually, uh, going down the line, it produced Takey. Uh, so she was mostly Florida panther with a little bit of Central American cougar mixed in. And on July 12, the zoo acquired her. Uh, she would be the only panther of the zoo's history for eight years uh, until the arrival of George, which we'll talk about. And then in November 1987 brought the arrival of Tony. Tony was a one-year-old tiger who was confiscated uh, from a person keeping him as a pet in Miami. Uh, by November 1987, top, or Tony arrived at the zoo. And then later, a year later, uh, in November 1988, a new exhibit would open for Tony on the other side of the zoo, roughly where the bear exhibit is today. Um, then in addition, joining uh, Tony in that exhibit, in 1989 would be Collie the Bengal Tiger. Uh, Collie came from the Knoxville Zoo, just like uh, Princess did. Uh, they would be the zoo's resident tigers uh, for about 15 years. So in March 1989, eight, 1989 uh, the zoo got EZA accreditation. Uh, this is something that the zoo wanted to do for quite some time, but wasn't able to because of the zoo's debt. So finally, Director Gail Schneider, uh, in 1989, was able to uh, achieve AZA accreditation. At this time, it was known as the AAZPA. Uh, it wouldn't be known as the AZA for another four years. So, in 1994, uh, uh, George, the Texas Cougar, arrived at the zoo. 
George was part of a study by the Fish and Wildlife Service to see how feasible it was to introduce cougars, Texas cougars, into northern Florida where there were very few Florida panthers left. Uh, most of the, the cougars worked out very well in the wild, except for George. George ended up having one vasectomy before he left, uh, which failed, and he ended up breeding with two females in the wild producing cubs. On top of that, George uh, attacked a horse and ended up killing a house cat. Uh, so he became known as the failure of the study and was subsequently brought back into captivity. Uh, and he arrived at the zoo in 1994. Uh, so before coming to the zoo, Fish and Wildlife Service gave him a second vasectomy to keep him from breeding with Tiki once he was here. And the second vasectomy failed. Um, so on March 17, 1995, two panther cubs were born at the zoo. Uh, unfortunately, one week later, uh, Takey accidentally slit the throats of one of them, killing it. Um, after that, the remaining panther was separated from Takey and hand raised by people like Sal Zeitlin uh, and Esther. Sal Zeitlin, by this time, uh, by the way, had replaced Howard Waite as zoo veterinarian in 1984, so he was the main one taking care of Colin uh, as he became known by this time. Colin would remain at the zoo until 2012. Uh, Tiggy and George, by the way, would later go on to move to Homosassa Springs Wildlife Park up in northern Florida. Oh, I'm just there. Hang up. So in 1996, uh, Navalong came to the zoo, and following her, Muchacho came. Muchacho was born in 1994 and was found orphaned in an or oil field in Lima, Peru, by a farmer. Muchacho lived with the farmer for three years illegally. And eventually, in 1997, his house got foreclosed on, and the government stepped in uh, to take over Muchacho. Uh, that's when the zoo was able to acquire Muchacho. Uh, it would be at the zoo uh, up until recently last year. Um, Muchacho and Avalon would remain in this exhibit, which is also roughly where the bear exhibit is today. The tiger and uh, jaguar exhibit kind of occupy that same space next to each other. So Moldy a Modern Zoo, so we're getting up to more modern history here. So in January 1997, uh, the zoo changed its name after being known for uh, as the Dreyer Park Zoo for about 40 years. Finally changed its name to Palm Beach Zoo at Dreyer Park. Uh, in addition, that same year in 1997, uh, Harriet and George Cornell would give one of the largest donations to the zoo in its history, uh, resulting in a redevelopment plan for the zoo. So the zoo, up until this point, had had several uh, master plans done. Uh, the original was done by Howard Waite back in 1969 when the Zoological Society was founded. There was another one done in the 1980s, uh, which would have involved a Florida section over where Tiger Falls is today, uh, a, a macaw exhibit of about 40 to 50 macaws at the entrance, uh, and all of TOA would be a big picnic grove in this plan. Uh, and then an additional plan was done in the mid-90s uh, which ended up not getting public support since it involved taking over 16 acres of Dreyer Park North and starting an African section. Uh, it would have had giraffes and bonobos as the main animals. Uh, so that was scaled back, and eventually it was redone as this master plan in 1997. So to compare this, this is a map at the time from 1997. You can see that TOA doesn't exist, uh, Tiger Falls, uh, the Fountain, Florida Loop, none of that's in existence yet. That changed on March 19, 2000, uh, with the opening of Tiger Falls. So Tiger Falls originally opened for Tony and Collie. They had lived in that exhibit on the west side of the zoo, uh, or the east side of the zoo, oh, sorry, uh, for about 10 years at this point. And this was a brand new exhibit for them. Uh, Collie would not live in the exhibit for a long time. She would pass away in 2002. Uh, but Tony would enjoy this exhibit for quite some time. Uh, this was a $750,000 project and was the beginning of the redevelopment for the zoo. Following that, in 2001, was the development of the Florida Pioneer Trail. Uh, this was done in various phases uh, with things like uh, the Bear Exhibit, for example, opening in 2005, which we'll talk about. But the vast majority of it was completed in 2001. Uh, this area already had exhibits like Panthers uh, and Spoonbills, uh, but this was all organized into a main central loop as it is today at this point. Then in March 2002, the Tropics Cafe opened. Uh, throughout the zoo's history, it had little snack bars, but nothing like a full-service restaurant. So this was a $3.3 million project uh, that opened in March of 2002 as the very first uh, major restaurant for the zoo. Uh, then on March 27, 2003, the Orientation Fountain was opened. 
Uh, as I said earlier, up until this point, the zoo's entrance had been where the exit is today. Uh, and by opening this orientation fountain, the zoo's entrance was moved over to the right, and that became its exit. Uh, so this was a $1.8 million project in total uh, that involved a 54-foot uh, in diameter uh, fountain, along with little laminar walk fountains where the frog bug is today. Uh, in case any of you guys weren't there at the time, that's kind of what the sides looked like uh, before the fountain kind of stopped working. <laughs> so, Tropics of the Americas. So, TOA was originally proposed in that plan that I talked about in 1995-ish. Uh, it was a much simpler plan at the time. It was more just a boardwalk along various exhibits. It wasn't a major complex like it should be. But uh, by 1997, with the redevelopment, it actually had a major plan. Uh, it was planned in two different phases. The first plan is in existence today. You can see it. It involves you know, the two pyramids, Jaguar exhibit, the tree, the cave, uh, the bridge, all of that. The second phase, which was never completed, uh, would have taken up you know, the top of TOA, where parking is today. Uh, it would have involved a giant otter exhibit, roughly where next to where the commissary is today. Uh, there would have been a large aviary over at the top, imagine Pen 9 type area. And then over on the other side where all the horticultural stuff is, that would be a big discovery center uh, that would trace the Amazon River through. Uh, none of that was actually completed, but on, uh, in 1999, groundbreaking for TOA happened. Five years later of construction, TOA opened on June 17, 2004. Uh, it was an $18 million project that brought about 500 new animals into the zoo originally. And then on March 12, 2005, the Florida Loop was finally completed with the completion of the bear exhibit. Uh, Lewis and Clark had arrived uh, four years earlier in 2001. You can see the pictures there. You can even tell them apart of this babies with their noses. But uh, so. That right there, for example, in the bottom right there, uh, is Gary Hambushin. He, most of the redevelopment was done under Sal Zeitlin from his time here in 1999 to 2003, but in 2004 to 2005, uh, Gary Hambushin completed uh, the redevelopment. In November 8, 2006 came the arrival of modern Rimba, the Malayan Tigers. Modern Rimba were born in San Diego a year earlier and arrived at the zoo uh, to rotate on exhibit with Tony. Uh, Tony, by this time, was one of the oldest tigers in America. Um, so Modern Rimba and Tony rotated on exhibit for two months. Unfortunately, Tony ended up passing away in January of 2007. Uh, he was one of the oldest tigers in America at the age of 20. And then on April 22, 2009, uh, the Melvin J. and Claire Levine Animal Care Complex open to the public. Uh, this was a five and a half million dollar project that finally brought a legitimate uh, animal hospital to the zoo. From the early 1980s up until this point, the zoo's current volunteer office operated as the zoo's animal hospital. And it wasn't the best situation because necropsies and surgeries were being done in the same room, so it wasn't very sanitary. Uh, so this new center actually allowed for more expansive opportunities with that. Then on June 29, 2010, brought the opening of Wallaby Station. Uh, this was a redevelopment of the Prairie Dog exhibit that opened in 1994 originally. And then on June 25, 2010, uh, Koala Forest opened. This was a redevelopment of the zoo's petting zoo, which opened after uh, the petting zoo got moved from roughly where the fountain is today. Uh, when the fountain was developed in 2003. And then finally, on October 2013, the zoo changed its name to the Palm Beach Zoo and Conservation Society to better reflect its mission of inspiring people to act on behalf of wildlife and the natural world. I was hoping Andrew would come today, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So, why is it important to know the history of the Palm Beach Zoo? So, like I had started off with, the zoo does not have its history very well documented. If you go through the archives of the zoo, most of it's from the 1990s onward. Uh, so that's not a good place for the zoo to be in right now. A lot of the original people and documents and events are being lost over time as the zoo continues to not uh, expand on its knowledge of its history. Uh, in 1993, Paul Dreher, the founder of the zoo, ended up passing away at the age of 90. Uh, following him would be Charles Camus, uh, who was the very first society president, uh, as well as William Beebe, who was one of the original founders as well. 
Um, in 2012, Dave Ellis ended up passing away. He was the third director of the zoo and was the one that ended up selling Tabi. Uh, he was director of the Northwest Trek in Washington. Anyone familiar with that part? Mm -hmm. That's AZA. See so you guys. Um, and then finally, last year, unfortunately, we lost Howard Waite, uh, the very first director of the Palm Beach Zoo, Trailer Park Zoo at the time. About a month ago, I met with George Samra. He was one of the original seven founders, as you may recall, uh, of the Zoological Society. He was the first secretary at the time. I met him at his home uh, just north of here. He's an 85-year-old man who has lived in his home for 63 years now. Uh, and he had a lot of thoughts on the zoo's history from when he was there and what it is today. Um, but one of the comments that he made to me that stuck out the most was a comment that he made that it's been 46 years since the Zoological Society was founded, and he stated that I am the very first person to ever talk to him in those 46 years about the zoo's history. That tells me that in 46 years, out of the hundreds upon hundreds of people who have passed through the doors of the Palm Beach Zoo, nobody has bothered to record and preserve the zoo's history. Not a single person. That's not a good place for the zoo to be in into the future. The zoo is going to improve and expand and evolve over time, but that evolution doesn't mean anything if you don't remember the people, the animals, and the events that got you to where you are today. Thank you.